Hello and welcome, PML fans. I'm your host, Joe Zamore here, and my co-host is also with me, Stuart J. Mills. Good evening, or good morning, or wherever you are in the world. It's uh, great to be here. And we are bringing you week six of the PML recap of PML Draft Center. And you know how we started. Feels like we were episode. just here yesterday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy how that how time flies. Um, really is. <laughs> and uh, you know how we start these videos. We're going to go ahead and lead off with my battle until I actually play good enough or a tight enough game to get game of the week. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to make promises, but I'm sure you'll get one in there. I'm sure you will. I'm hoping. Uh, but for now, <laughs> week uh, six leads off with the Chartriots versus the Chicago Chonks. And uh, as much as I wish I didn't remember this game, I remember this game. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a bit of a, I suppose from your side, it was a bit of a, a letdown, but it was a bit of a cracker of a match and a lot of um, history and a lot of, I'm not going to call it beef, but, you know, a lot going into it. I'm pretty sure you'd uh, never... Never lost to um, Danny in a league match. So um, when I saw, saw the team previews, I was like, oh, no, um, Joe's going to have problems with Vileplume. And sure enough, that's what it came to be. In fact, um, my moment of the match was finding out that Vileplume pretty much walled Dragobolt. How did you feel at that point? On which one? Where Volplume pretty much walled Dragapult. Oh, yeah. That one, it was a crazy thing. It was a mix of uh, Vileplume was just ready for me. And also that Fire Blast Mist was kind of big. I'm not saying it would have changed the game into my favor, but it would have at least dropped the differential on that match. Yeah. But also, um, when uh, Danny decided to max Kangaskhan, even though it was at half health, and the first movie clicks was Max Airstream. That kind of put you on the back foot too, because that killed your Roserade, and it was plus one speed, and it was just going to be annoying, especially with the scrappy ability, which I'm sure you had plenty of uh, trouble with. Yeah, I was not expecting a offensive Kangaskhan, because, you know, he brought it once this season, you know, semi-offensive, and this week he went hard offensive with that Kangaskhan, so it was hard to play around. Um, what was your philosophy of leading off with Toxic Spikes? Um, I I knew um, Vileplume would come, and I wanted to force it out later in the game. I did not expect it to lead, but I figured uh, get Toxic Spikes up now, make him switch out, and he just would not switch. And you know, I, I was trying to force him in game position of for myself and that match just did not yeah. go my way in any way. Um, yeah, well, that was um, unfortunate that Incineroar got poisoned anyway, but then at least you got off a uh, blaze kick on the uh, hit molly. Mm-hmm. Do you know offhand if that would have killed, killed without the crit? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was... Because I know hit molly, hit molly is very weak. He said he had some investment, but no investment uh, Hitmon Lee was 99 to 108 without the crit. And he said he didn't right. have that much investment, so it might have not mattered anyway. But, you know. Yeah, especially because he was heavy duty boots or whatever it was. So mm-hmm. that was a great play to kick knockoff. Um, oh, sorry, to uh, click Blaze Kick. Yeah, at that point, I he, uh, he switched it in, of course, hoping. To... Exactly, because he switched it in hoping for a knockoff, and then he clicked Blaze Kick and it okayed him. But um, of course, that just sent Valfling back in, and those T spikes went away. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And then, of course, you know, he plays around a bit of a zoom roll, and next thing you know, you got Kangas Khan in front of you. And, of course, Scrappy Box Intimidate, which is annoying when you have a Incineroar in your team. Yeah, and uh, there was just nothing I could do about it. Uh, I had to sack some mods. Right. There was no Intimidate to slow it down. And uh, I honestly don't even remember how I got it off the field. <laughs> <laughs> what was your... um? What was your... Sorry, what was your Grimmsnarl set? Did you have T-Wave or anything? 
I can't remember. <clears throat> that week, no, it was more like a bulk up drain punch set, and I, I, I believe, and I couldn't get it going because there was just no open. Yeah. Um, the reflect. No, actually, it wasn't. It was a reflect support set because um. I was really, it was T-Wave. I was really afraid of Belly Drum, but I wanted that reflect. And because I mm. thought I would live a hit and then it crit through the screen, I think. And, or it just got a high roll. And yeah. Yeah, it got a high roll the second time. Yeah. It, it, um, it, it didn't work out in my favor. I didn't expect Facade to do 50% through reflect. So the fact that it was a high roll the second time, at least Kangaskhan went down to poison afterwards, but. Man, that was a tough round of turns for you there, got to say. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, that's the game of Pokemon. Some weeks you get to, you get it in your favor, some weeks you don't. Exactly right. And um, just proof that Strength Sap is pretty busted when it when it's uh, used in the right way. So it was like all your attacking threats were pretty much down before he sent in Mudsdale, and then once he sent in Mudsdale and maxed it, it was GG. Yeah, it was over at that point. And uh, uh, Vile Plume was still around, so I couldn't threaten it with uh, Gastrodon, and it was just, it was not my game. <laughs> it was not my game to win. No, it wasn't your game. When you've got Mudsdale and Vile Plume pretty much walling your entire team, you know you're in trouble. So, I mean, I guess you just take it on the chin and move on to next week and, you know, hope that you can pull it back. Yeah, that's the plan. Uh, my game with the Narahata Hoppers will be up tomorrow from this video or the same day as this video so uh go ahead and watch that see if i bounce back or not looking forward to it so yeah big four i went to danny there to start off week six which was i was surprised to be honest but um you know these these sort of things happen and once again at team preview it was not looking pretty so and that brings us to our next match between the wiki wacky wishy washies and the pecatonica fire squirrels yeah, this is a good match. The um, Battle of the Woman, of course. So you've got um, the league has been playing really well, but has made a few um, few wrong moves and matches to cost her. And you've got Shelby, who started off with a hiss and a roar, but has faded away the last couple of weeks. So, you know, both players not at the top of the game, but of course they're, all, they're both great battlers from what we've seen so far. So I was looking forward to watching this. And to be honest, it didn't disappoint. It was... Um, one of those matches where I actually couldn't tell who was going to win early on. And it wasn't until a couple of the max turns had happened, I was like, oh, yeah, this is going one way. And uh, that was in favour of Shelby, ultimately, spoilers. But, um, yeah, well played by both both players in this one. Yeah, it's always good to see um, two teams uh, in the lower rankings really fighting it out to try to scrap their way to the top. Well, that's right. Um it was nice to see uh, Belly Drum Politoed this week. That's one out of the books. That's one you don't see very often at all. Um, of course, you know, Belly Drum Poly Wrath is quite quite common as one of its sets, but mm -hmm. Poly Toad, you usually see it as defensive because it's there for the rain. But um, when Lily led it and Shelby led Bishop, I don't think she was really ready to set it up straight away. So, you know, she had Rotom there to, to counter Bishop a little bit, but Bishop SD'd and um, even after it set up and reflect, it got smacked by 90% for knockoff, which shows how strong Bishop is. But um, when it, you know, it clicked overheat in the rain and it still killed Bishop, which I thought was interesting. I expected Bishop to um, survive it, but uh, even in the rain, it still killed it. Um, that let Shelby send in Dust Noir, and uh, basically it did, Rotom was doing absolutely nothing to it. And yeah. um, then, then came the uh, Politoed, and you got you got the belly drum, and that's one of the highlights of the match here. But uh, for me, the moment of the match was when Leafeon was using Grassy Glide, which, of course, is the move most associated with Rillaboom, and it gives you priority when there's grassy terrain. Mm -hmm. And uh, Shelby had used Leafeon as her maxmon. It had used max overgrowth to against the uh, wishy-washy of the wishy-washies. And then set up the grassy terrain. And even though it had to wait till it was not maxed anymore to use grassy terrain, uh, grassy glide, sure enough, it did. And unfortunately for Lily, she sent in a couple of moms that died to the grassy glide before the terrain went away. Whereas if she maybe held them back, it might not have been as uh, disastrous. 
But um, you've got to say that sending in a four times week mine like Ripera, even with solid rock to hit, you know, if you on use grassy glide on it and it died <laughs> instantly. So there you go. <laughs> Yeah, it's always a fun battle when you see Mons doing things out of the ordinary, but, you know, you also got to see the Pokemon that stay tried and true to their natural sets. Exactly right. But, yeah, so, the Bell John Polytone was cool. It's just a bit slow, so, um, even though it killed the Dusk Dryer with a, a Thief, which is always a fun move to use, um, it died to free try. So, that was, you know, it killed by Mons and died. Whether that was worth it or not, I'm not sure. But uh, at least this time, the rain turns worked out a little bit better because when she maxed wishy washy, she could use max geyser to set up the rain. Mm-hmm. But uh, unfortunately, you can't go sending in your Kingdra when there's a um, nine towers on the other team, even with the rain. So, what can we say? It was, um, shall we finish the match off with Toxic Croak using Dual Chop, which was a great bring, I've got to say, because of course that's Dragon Type and that's super effective against Kingdra. Mm-hmm. And between, um, you know, with only Kingdra and Rotom left, Toxic Rope finished the job. So that was a, a really good match to Shelby. There were some really high moments for both players, but ultimately Leafeon was just too strong with the grassy terrain. And then that was just basically the turning point for Lily, unfortunately. Yeah. And these are all fun games. And, uh, this draft league, you're really seeing the creativity coming out of these coaches this late in the season. Oh, 100%. 100%. All right. Well, that brings us to our third battle of the game, and that's going to be the New Orleans Infern Apes versus the New York Aqua Jets. Yes, Melvin versus Alex. Now, this was going to be another close one. Both teams, once again. They've had their moments, but overall they've been struggling to get some momentum this season. Mm-hmm. And uh, Alex, I don't know, he's just, his, some of his sets are becoming a little bit predictable, I'm afraid, so he leads the Whimsicott, and of course, Melbourne assumes this, and he leads Magwater and clicks Overheat, which takes down the Whimsicott to the sash. does get the Trick Room off, but um, got to say, the moment of the match for me was when Hatterene lived a max flare and then KO'd Max at Monchan after their first turn of Dynamax only. So, as we said last week, if you can limit the damage or lessen the number of max turns that your opponent gets, chances are you're going to be on your way to a win. And this match was no different between Pilot Swine being really, really bulky and really, really offensive as well at the same time. And, um, had a rain just being a trick room defensive beast between those two mons melvin pretty much had no momentum the whole match and it showed with alex coming together to win 3-0 at the end yeah another close game and uh i think this one was actually a finish this match finished this this week yeah it did, and um, but yeah, once again, like Polis White, man, I had eight flamethrowers. It set up stealth rocks. It um, it took a crit overheat for Polis White, White to die. Not sure if it mattered or not, but ultimately, it it, it had already done the damage. Um, you know, what's he got? A lot of Marowak coming in and doing a lot of Marowak things, but it too got crit by an overheat, so it lived on not much. But um, yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't really the match for Melvin, unfortunately. There wasn't he, anything he tried to do apart from a couple of crit overheats. Anything he did, Alex had an answer for, and he brought some good sets this week. And he showed how good Escavalier is, even though it's super slow. It eats hits that aren't fire, and it, it pretty much destroyed Mimikyu by itself. It helped mm-hmm. that Mimikyu missed the win on this, but you know we take the good with the bad. And then it killed Sinchino to win the match. And yeah, that pretty much sums it up. It was a it was a good one for Alex. He needed it. He needed to come through and get a good good win and he did three oh. It was clean. Yeah, let's see if it boasts his confidence for this week seven match coming up. 
And uh, that leads us to our next battle here. We got Team Tempest versus the Vegas Club Jangmoos. One team coming off a loss, one team coming off a big win. And let's see how this turned out. So once again, the newcomers, well, they're not really newcomers anymore, but the latecomers for the league, the Vegas Club Jangmoo, have just showed they're pretty much on softball at the moment. He's won four on the trot now, and this week was no different. So you've got to say that uh, the JMO are quickly becoming one of the favourites. Yeah, they're certainly climbing in the ranks. So for me, the uh, moment of the match in this one was when um, Septile Dynamaxed, and then Kiwi forgot about Unburdened that turn. It wasn't until after um, Septile killed something. I can't remember what it was right now, but uh, uh, oh, killed Galera Dimanitan, and then Kiwi was like, why are you faster? Oh, does this get unburdened? And he's like, it does get unburdened. So whether that would have changed the outcome of the match, I'm not sure, because unburdened Septiles that fast uh, outspeeds most things that aren't, you know, weather boosted or scarfed or something. But, yeah, once your beast Galera Dimanitan goes down, you know you're going to be in trouble. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Septile not only killed the Dimanitan, it killed the Dusclops as well. Um, Cinderace tried to sucker punch it, but Septile endured, but it died to a second sucker punch. However, Cinderace was choice banded, and the danger with being choice banded in the sucker punch is that you get a free setup. And in this game, it was Guard of War. Guard of War came in, substituted, calm minded, and even though Neuvern had Infiltrator, Boom Burst did some damage. I'm not sure if two Shadow Balls would have killed. Um, I know Boom Burst is a higher base power, but Shadow Balls are super effective, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, this, but Boom Burst plus Shadow Ball only got Guard of War into the red. And then Guard of War revealed that it had a Salic Berry, which raised its speed, stored power, finished off the Noivern, Cinderace died to rocks, and that was GG to the Jang Mo. It was um, another one of those games where Someone got on top early, and then they just ran away with it. Yeah, and that's a great prep on his part, uh, and fi- uh, figuring that Cinderace was choice banded there and taking advantage of it with that setup. Exactly, and you know, even at the start, Kiwi predicted a Swampert lead, so led me and Shao, so that he could sword start to turn one, predicting mm-hmm. Stealth Rocks. That's exactly what happened. And so... You got a plus two, me and Xiao. Kiwi said, so, oh, so I'm going to Dynamax it right now. Queried it for a brief moment, like, is it too early? No, I'm just going to do it. Max airstreamed. How, what did Swampert click? Swampert yawned. And, you know, that's just great prep, too. Mm-hmm. So, hey, that's, a, that's, a, that's a D-Max killer right there. Pretty much. So, yes, me and Xiao got to get off a Max Knuckle next turn to kill the Swampert, but then it fell asleep. So you had a plus one speed, plus one attack, or plus three attack at this stage, me and Xiao. But it's asleep. He stays in to try and wake up, of course, but then uh, Metagross takes it out, and we all know what happens from after that. Yeah, it's always, it's always tough when you have a setup mon already set up and ready to go, and it falls asleep, and you, you're trying to be like, hey, you know, I did this work, I want it to go, and it just stays sleeping on the job. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but also, like, yeah, Kiwi Cinderace was, you know, Bandit Cinderace was scary ordinarily, and it did do a heap of damage with Pyroball in the middle of the match. But once again, once you lock into a move like Sucker Punch, you're in trouble. Yeah, well, Team Tempest uh, not having a great season, but, you know, he, he's certainly giving it his all. And, of course, Jang Mo just finding his groove, and it's really making it tough to beat him. Yeah, really tough. Um, just the confidence in the match and the, the plays they're making and the predictions are all on point. And when you put all those on point, you're going to be a threat. And it's proven to be the case. And if you like ASMR, you got to go hear his videos because he, he's a uh, low-talking, cool-talking dude. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us yeah. to our next match of the game. It's going to be Silvali, the Crescent Silvali, versus the Virginia Victini. No, this is another good match. You've had the Crushing Silvalis that have been on the up and up of late, and you had uh, Rick and Mike that has pretty much beaten everyone except for uh, 
when he was facing the Cardinals. So, um, for me, the moment of the match in this match was when Gigalith died to Archeops, which essentially cost the Savalis the match because they needed Sam for extra, extra drill to beat Firamosa. As we know, Firamosa has just been kicking everyone's ass in the league this season. Mm-hmm. It's just so fast, so powerful. And yeah, it's frail, but when you're so fast, it doesn't matter. Unless someone's prepped Focus Sash or, um, you know, Weather or Scarf or some other, you know, um, priority or something like that, Firamos is going to run through teams. And it's kind of ironic because this week, Firamos didn't even hit the field hardly at all. It didn't, um, it wasn't the threat that he should have been looking out for. It was Heracross. And to some credit, um, they did show a little bit of concern over here across the team preview. Though I don't really have, I don't really have much for um, here across, but uh, they weren't to know that later on in the match, that's exactly what was going to be a problem. And um, yeah, here across Max's, it almost kills Sylveon with Max Airstream, and then it does. Slow King dies as well, and then Excursion dies as well. So got those last three kills for a mini sweep at the end, but. Um, what can we say? It was just a, it was a surprising end to the match. I'm going to say after all the back and forth in the middle of the match, but uh, when Gigalith went down, it was definitely going to be a problem because the sand was needed for Estriol to outspeed the Feramosa, as I said, but it would have outspeed everything else too. And without that ability to outspeed, it was um, mincemeat as far as Heracross was concerned. Mm-hmm. All right, and that brings us to our next match, and that is going to be the CF Pram Ranch versus the Narahata Hoppers. All right, so this is a Scrub Supreme versus Misery Gear. It was uh, another one I was looking forward to based on their records over the last couple of weeks. Um, for me, the moment of the match was when plus one Cramorant didn't outspeed Rotom Fan, and that ultimately cost him the match. Um, I'm pretty sure in his video he mentioned that he should have calped whether it was going to outspeed Scarf Roton mm-hmm. at plus one, but I'm not sure if it could or if it's just that they're running modest instead of timid or something like that. But um, ultimately, the Cramorant was probably set to sweep if it hadn't got killed, but it was slower than the Roton, and um, the match ended up fizzling out to a 3-2 timer win to Misery. Didn't really that that result doesn't really describe how good the match actually was in between. It's just a shame that it was on a timer match. It wasn't a land match, but um, it was good to good to see them going back and forth, back and forth, kill after kill after kill after kill. And yeah, it was nice to see Cramorant hit the field and do some of the job that it was picked to do as the uh, team mascot. But um, yeah, what can we say? Yeah, you gotta love when the mascot shows uh, shows its power for your team, especially those lower tier mascots that don't get the recognition they deserve. Yeah, the other thing is that um, Cramorant had brought Belch specifically so they could use Max Ooze to raise its special attack. So on the second Max turn, he could have clicked Max Airstream to go plus two, but he decided to go um, Max Ooze to go plus one. Um, special attack on plus one speed. If he'd gone plus two, he would have outsped the Rotom and we would probably be talking about a different result, but he didn't and it didn't. So um, when Tentacruel and Max Hale stormed, it changed the weather and it chipped Cram for a little bit more than he probably intended as well. Mm-hmm. And although he got the la- he got the rain back up with his last Max move, it was just too late because Rotom came in. Um, he said if he got to Calc, Choice Scarf wrote on, and sure enough, it went down four times a week to to Electric, and that's pretty much it. The timer ran out. Yeah, and those games are tough, especially this late in the season to lose one of those like that, but with two weeks left, I'm sure he could bounce back and make that run for one of those uh, lower spots in the bracket. Yeah, I mean, there were some good brings anyway, like Garchomp brought Ironhead, um, Galarian Weezing was a great bring because, of course, it's immune to Garchomp's dual stab, but the uh, plus two Ironhead did a sizable chunk and 
to be fair, the strange team did about 80% back to Garchomp. So, you know, it's one of those matches where they brought a counter, but then they countered the counter, which was pretty good to see. It was you know, good prep from both sides. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, Scrub was hoping to go for Reflect with his bronze on, but it got hit by a Stone Edge instead, so it didn't even get an attack off. So it's, it's just moments like that in a match where you're expecting a, you know, the helpful screens to be able to set up another another Pokemon and then you don't get that opportunity. Yeah, and that's that's the game you play when you're uh, trying to get that setup going for you. But that brings exactly us... Exactly right. To... And, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're all right. You're all good. No, go ahead. If you, you want to say one more thing. Oh, I was just going to say um, another unfortunate moment was when Talonflame missed a dual wing beat, which is one of those moves that uh, seems to miss more than 10% of the time, that's for sure. But, uh, yeah. I don't think it ended up costing the match, but it definitely didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does, that move is tough. It's a, such a good move, but it's such a unreliable move at the same time. But that brings us to our game of the week. Sadly, we only have seven games uh, from here on out. Uh, we did have the drop, like we mentioned in the last video, from the Ninkatas. They came in to take over for uh, Alice, and uh, they ended up dropping themselves. So, you know, it is what it is. It's too late in the season and uh, to take over a team that's, of course, in last place. So we're just going to go ahead and uh, roll with the seven games a week that we have now. And like I said, game of the week goes to the Mad Chesney Slowpokes versus the Arizona Cardinals. Oh, what a game of the mat- a game of the week it was! Um, of course, this was a top of the table clash in the Gala Conference. First place, unbeaten Arizona Cardinals against the second place, coming up quite quickly, McKenzie Park Slowpokes. And at me, like I said, it didn't disappoint. For me, the moment of the match was where, after a bit of back and forth play between Persimian and Confable, where a Predator was trying to get a flinch with Persimian using Iron Head, it actually did. And earlier, Persimian had been paralyzed by Thunder Wave. And of course, Parahax came into it, so Clefable was able to heal up. But after a bit of back and forth, Persimian got those two Iron Heads off in a row. And that killed Clefable. And the quote from a Predator was that that opens the door for Slurpuff. And sure enough, Slurpuff finally got its belly drum. And it finally got to finish off a match with a mini sweep at the end. So uh, what can we say? The underdog, you've got to say he's the underdog because he wasn't unbeaten. But a Predator comes through and defeats the now not unbeaten Chardinals. Yeah, this is the situation where you see it in uh, sports normally, or, you know, esports, um, where you think of a David and Goliath type battle, but this was Goliath versus Goliath, let's be honest, the top two teams in their division. And uh, the Majesty Park Slowpokes were just able to outplay the Cardinals in just a small section of the game and end up getting that big win at the end. Pretty much. Like, at the very start, he led Sigilith, um, Adam did, and he realized he brought the wrong one because it was one without Psychic. And he was like, oh, they're going to lead to Galgi. I can hit it with a Psychic. And then he's like, oh, I should have checked my Mons. And it's just, this is this Harmony reminder, guys. Check your Mons. And yeah. then if you haven't checked them, check them. And if you check them, check them again, just to make sure. Ultimately, <laughs> it didn't matter. But um, it's just one of those things where Galgi probably would have died quite early on if it hadn't been for the fact he had to click air slash instead of psychic yeah and uh, um, that's where he, he did also, bring he, that's where he also brought up at the end of the battle sorry. that he actually did mean to bring dark pulse to stop because he said that was yes. maybe one of the only things to stop the starmie that's right so it wasn't until starmie was in front of him and um, max but he was like oh that's why i bought dark pulse that's right but um it was pretty funny at the start because he was like, oh, no, I should have bought Psychic. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, of course, um, Corviknight's proven to be a beast for uh, the Cardinals, and Sigilith did very little to it with Air Slash. Even Heatwave didn't do much. Um, actually, I lied. That took it down to a few HP. But yeah, it turned out. So, yeah. So, um, I mean, when Persimian came out, he named it your favorite player, Tom Brady. 
Tom Brady. So um, he went for Tom six. Tom Brady, and he um, clicked EQ just to see if Corbinat would switch in, which of course it did. So he didn't want to match it straight away. Mm-hmm. He then wanted to see if he would switch into Fable on a close combat, and sure enough, he did switch to Fable. Um, he wanted to kill the Corvenite, of course, so clicking CC was the option. However, that put him at minus one defense, minus one special defense. Um, but he, even then, he decided to max it, and I thought that was a really good play because normally, if um, my opponent had lowered stats, especially in defense, I probably wouldn't think they were going to max, but he did anyway, knowing that he was going to use moves like Max Quake and Max Steel Spike to raise his defense and special defense back to even. Yeah, he went for the, you live by the Blitz, you die by the Blitz, and he was certainly keeping the pressure on the Cardinals with that move right there. Exactly right, and it was also very clever that Blazkin came out and he predicted the Protect, but he maxed the streams because mm-hmm. he knew that he would still be faster than Blaziken after its speed boost, and that's exactly what happened. And then, of course, um, the Chardinals take a little bit of time at this point, and I'm pretty sure that they were calculating whether or not Blaziken is worth switching out, or if it's going to die to a Max Quake or another Max Airstream or whatever. Ultimately, it dies to a Max Quake. And then Basimian Max Steel spikes the Fable, knocking it down to 40%. And that's when Clefable T waves it. So he was like, oh, maybe maybe I should still be faster. And sure enough, he was still faster. So he was trying to get the Ironhead flinch. But of course, Ironhead flinched the first time and then not the second time to kill. So Clefable healed up. And then the first time he got it back down and then he got paralyzed. So he couldn't get it. So Clefable healed back up. And it wasn't until I think the third time where he Ironhead twice in a row and finally got the kill. And he's like, that's it. It's pretty much game over now because it's free for slip off. And so basically it was a matter of managing Stami's max turns because um, he could, could click the slip up on whenever he wanted. Yeah, exactly right. And um, yes, Stami used side shock and it got slip up down to, I think, 13 HP. But with the um, Citrus Berry, it got it back up over half, which was enough for it to do the, the belly drum. So it was very lucky. So he won the match with a 13 HP slurp up, which was cool to see. Mm-hmm. Of course, it wasn't um, 13 HP by the end because it drain punched a few things. But it's not very often you see a P2 go down in one hit, and that's what exactly what happened. That's what a plus six will do to you. The only thing that could have... <laughs> exactly right. But pretty much the only thing that could have stopped him at that point was missing play rough on the trigology. But I'm not convinced that... Uh, that even that would have stopped the momentum that he had. But yeah, it was ultimately a commanding, once again, a 3-0 win to a Pareto in the top of the table clash. I don't know how it affects the uh, the differentials for the two teams, but now they're on the same record. So definitely something to fight for. It opens up the division heaps, heaps and heaps. So yeah. a lot to play for if you get that top spot. Yeah, we'll certainly be going over the recap. But definitely worth That's right. And we'll be certainly going over the rankings here in a second. So, uh, GG to the game of the week. And that brings us to our MVP of the week. And that goes to the Virginia Victinis Heracross with four kills. So much competition this week. There were so many Mons who were just right under that threshold, that 3-0, 3-1. But Heracross is the only one who peaked at four and was able to win the game for him. Yeah, I was going to say it only got three, but no, of course, it um, okoed the uh, Trigalgy from, not the Trigalgy, the Driftlim from full mm-hmm. with uh, knockoff, which totally surprised the opponent because um, they, they said they had quite a considerable amount of defensive investment and it still died to a um, guts boosted, super effective knockoff. Yeah, that's the thing about Driftlim too. The, it's, it's HP is fantastic, but if you're just putting uh, investment into the defense alone, it's not going to help it that much just because its base stat is no. like around 50, I believe. Yeah, especially just a balloon, right? So it makes sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. But no, yeah, very good. MV. I love Heracross. Um, another one of those bug types that you don't see a whole lot compared to like Scizor or whatever, but yeah. 
it was yeah. good to see it as MVP. It's another one of those lower of the... tier mons, uh, <clears throat> and uh, with all the talk, people really want to see it get moved up. So you never know by next season. So enjoy it while you can now. Yeah, that's right. We'll see what Gen Nine brings. <laughs> All right, and that brings us to our rankings for this week. And uh, you know, Stu, go ahead. Let's go, let's let you uh, talk about how <coughs> I got dropped in the ranking on on the Canto side, and I'll take care of the Galar this week. All right, fair enough. So the Canto division has got a new leader, and it is the Vegas Club GMO. They've got a five and one record now. They've been unbeaten since they joined the league, and they've got a plus 12 differential, which is also um, the highest in the Kendo division. Then you've got uh, yourself, Joe. You're a 4-2 and two now with a plus 9 differential, so not too far behind. Um, but you're even with the Chonks on record. They are 4-2 and two with a plus 6 differential, so as long as you keep winning, you should be all right. Uh, the CF Cramorants, they're in fourth place. They're 3-3 three and three with a minus 1 differential, so they're pretty close to 50-50. Um, Kiwi, the Team Tempest, is on the same record, 3-3, three and three, with a minus 8 differential. Um, the New York Aqua Jets, Alex Heath, has got a second win this week. He's 2-4 and four with a minus 5 differential, which is the same record as the 7th place New Orleans Infern Apes. They're 2-4 and four with a minus 8 differential. And uh, coming up the rear there, 8th place is Narahata Hoppers. They're 1-5 and five with a minus 8 differential. All right, and that brings us over to the Galar side, and where we also have a new leader. Um, we have the McChesney Park Slowpokes ranked number one with five and one record at plus fourteen differential. Second, we have the Arizona Cardinals who do not like that spot with five and one at plus nine. So you know they're going to be clawing back for that number one spot by the end of the season. Then you got your Virginia Victinis who are clawing their way up this bracket. They are. At Third place with five and one with plus four differential. Fourth, we got Crushing Silvali at three and three. Their differential is not great at negative six, but they have the wins to pay the bills. And in fifth place with a positive differential, two and four record with plus six. And if they can get that win next, this coming week, maybe they can try to take that spot back from the Crushing Silvalis. Sixth place, we have the Pecatonica Fire Squirrels at two and four with the negative seven. Of course, enjoying that win over the Wiki Waki Wishy Washies, who are sitting at seventh place with a one and five record at negative seven. And of course, our eighth spot goes to the team that dropped. So it's a uh, it's becoming yeah, more it's not, clear. It's not very often. Yeah, it's not very often you see a team lower in the rankings with a higher differential. But uh, such is life in Pokemon. Sometimes we you. Uh... You know, you win one match by heaps, and then you lose one closely. All of a sudden, you're negative record, but positive differential. So uh, I feel for the rebellion here. Of course, they were in uh, last place for a couple of weeks, so they've um, gone on a bit of a run here. So like you say, if they keep winning, they might threaten the top three. You never know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A few weeks to go. Like, uh, there's always those games where you might not win great. It might be an ugly win, but, hey, it's still a win, like Al Davis always said. Just win, baby, and that's all that matters. Exactly right. Exactly right. All right, guys. Well, that was our week six recap. I hope you guys enjoyed. Go like and subscribe to all of our coaches. Go enjoy those battles. I know I will again tomorrow, and we will see you guys next time. See you.